views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Now, welcome to Open BXRX Remote, our special coverage from my newly renamed living workspace, Chari Executive Suites. Uh, where we will continue to provide you uh, with the, an update on the impact COVID-19 is having on our community. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Cafe Con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll speak to Assembly Member Michael Benedetto, representing District 82, about the new COVID-19 mobile testing site at the Bay Plaza Mall. After that, we'll learn how to ease the body and mind from all the corona stress using inner compassion when we speak to the founders of Loving Meditations. Then we'll find out about the Bronx Arts Factory Online Art Challenge that will help support artists in the community through this global pandemic crisis. Uh, plus, we'll hear about the Bronx Bound Books uh, social distancing virtual series uh, featuring live story times by prominent authors. And later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us an up to date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features jazz saxophonist, composer, and lecturer Wayne Escoffrey, who's offering virtual classes and will perform for us at the end of the show. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way because now we are officially open. Open, I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café Con Leche for the next hour, encouraging you to get social with us online, especially during these social distancing times. Uh, you know, you can tweet us and follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV or like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And if you're interested in contacting me directly, you can find me on all platforms on Twitter, FB, Instagram, Insta Stories, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So, um, Throughout New York and, uh, well, the entire world for that matter, many people are faced with a new reality uh, that will result in major setbacks due to COVID-19. Our first priority, of course, is to stop the virus from spreading. And, um, well, Co-op City in the Bronx is the largest cooperative of its kind in the world with a huge population of seniors. And so our next guest recently helped secure a new COVID-19 mobile testing site at the Bay Plaza Mall for the northeast section of the Bronx um, that began Monday, March 30th. And in addition, he is in support of rent freezes for tenants and mortgage modifications for homeowners as well as small business tax suspensions. Please welcome Assembly Member Michael Benedetto. Hello and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Rena, especially uh, um, during these very, very mixed up times that we're in. And so thank you for having me. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it's quite refreshing to just get some sense of hope. Um, I, I, I personally appreciate everything you stand for. Um, let's start with the uh, mobile test siting that was just implemented recently on Monday. Yeah, we're very proud of that. Um, listen, there's a major problem out there. Uh, I'm a person who just says, let's get things done. Let's find a solution to the problem we have. And one of the major problems we have with all the people who has to be tested. And 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 so uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Senator Bailey, along with Speaker Carl Hasty, um, have joined in together with uh, Congressman Engel and, and Councilman um, um, Andy King. And we petitioned the mayor and we petitioned the governor. Um, we've got a density of people senior citizens, the largest um, natural occurring retirement community in the United States, right in Co-op City. Um, um, let's see if we can get the services 
brought to them. And so we did that. The governor heard our voice and we got it there on Monday and we're happy. Okay. So from my understanding, this is going to be taking place in the parking lot at the Bay Plaza Mall. That is and correct. So if we're dealing with seniors and they don't have a car, how is that going to work? Well, hopefully a good many of them do have cars, but that's a good point. Uh, and what they're doing in Co-op City is many of the seniors are coming in and they're joining hands. Again, as people do in emergencies like this, um, people join and help each other. We have an initiative run out of Senator Bailey's office and working with the religious groups in the area, uh, Bishop Rosario in particular and his wife, Nancy, that they are, um, vo have volunteers who are willing to pick up the senior citizen and bring them in as long as they call ahead for an appointment and so on. So we're trying to work out that problem. So, I know that's a little tricky, though, because now you're still subjecting people to other people. Correct. Correct. They will come into the car. They will be in the back seat. And I believe I'm not sure, but I believe they're putting protective barriers between the front seat and the rear seat. And hopefully they're doing the smart things now as everybody leaves, disinfecting for the next person and so on. Well, uh, it's really, really refreshing to know that that's now available up there because I believe there's about a good uh, 50,000 people who reside over there. That is correct. It's a give or take a couple of thousand. That's what you're talking about. And most importantly, too, it's not just um, 50,000 people. It is a large center for senior citizens and those people who have handicapping conditions. So when you combine those people in need and those people who are who are senior citizens, it's a it's a population that must be protected. That's wonderful. And so that being said, um, let's talk a little bit about your proposals or the four proposals that you support. Um, one of them being uh, rent freezes, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's a moratorium that's been placed in. However, um, the way things look is kind of like, oh, OK, great. You gave everybody a grace period. But what happens when we come back to real life? Everybody's coming right. back in debt. Right. Um, this must be looked on as an emergency package that is not time limited by, OK, the the virus has gone its way in three months or four months. It's all over with now. That doesn't end the problem. The problem continues because there are people who have been out of work and unable to pay and they have debts rolling up during the course of those three months, four months, whatever it might be. We've got to give them a way to undo those debts. And I'm so I'm talking about uh, a, a wrench freeze um, for people, but at the same time, we can't forget the landlords. Okay, landlords are often portrayed as evil, but they're not always evil. There are hundreds upon hundreds of good landlords out there that have to pay for the, the heating, have to pay for the air, the electricity, that have to pay for the uh, custodial staff. They have expenses too. And so we need a package to deal with them. We're going to need help from all levels of government, city, state, and in particular, the federal government, okay? And they've done a couple of stimulus um, packages already. They have to go back and do another stimulus package to aid us as we continue with this. So I also attended... Um a teleconference yesterday that was hosted by Mark Joni related to okay. small businesses. Small and businesses. Yes. And, and, and it was for, with SBA. And, and the, the interesting thing that stood out for me is that um, while I understand that everybody's trying their best to assist small businesses, it's like everything is related to a loan. And once again, it's another debt situation. That is correct. What, what the government should be. And again, it, it needs something big, and only government is big enough to do this. It is it is imperative that the government give out loans to let these businesses survive, but these lo line, loans will have to be given back over the period of, let's say, three or four years without 
interest. Okay, and that's very, very important that it is without interest. And because small businesses hire, I don't know what the percentage is, but 60% of the workforce in our city. And that's got to be respected. And those businesses have got to be maintained. What would our neighborhoods look like where you have shuttered stalls all, all around? This, this, Terrible, terrible crisis we're in affects so many people, so many, such a variety of different issues that we have to have a total umbrella to to uh, get us out of it. I still keep trying to wrap my head around the, the reality is, is that everything is at pause. And yeah. because everything is at pause, um, there's going to be a lot of loss. On, um, in various forms. And so while, yes, uh, as a, a tenant, as a, a homeowner, as a business owner, there's a certain level of responsibility in which we all have to take, right? However, if we've been put at a halt from doing what we need to to generate, how is it that we're going to get uh, assistance, for lack of a better word, that in turn it becomes our debt based on the fact that we had no choice but to sit? Right, right. And again, well, now we look towards the federal government. The federal government is already sending out stimulus checks to people, and that's all well and good. But one stimulus check for twelve hundred dollars ain't going to do it, okay? And well, how what do they even qualify for that? Well, if people, I, I, it would be based, on, as I understand it, on your tax returns and any household who has an income below um, $75,000, okay, would qualify for a stimulus check. Um, um, but these checks can't be a one-shot deal. Those checks got eaten up very, very quickly. The checks must be ongoing, maybe once every single month. They get their check until everybody is bound. Now back to work again. Okay. It, it, it is the job of government at times like this to act, to act forcefully and decisively and completely to help out everybody. The economy will come back. Okay. People will be back to work again. It's just a matter of time. It is that period of time where we have to help our, our citizens out. Well, at this present moment, that's what we're dealing with. We are dealing with the present. And um, based on everything that I've been attending via teleconference or, or, or just even phone conferences, um, it, it requires a level of, of proposal writing, uh, you know, submission. Everybody's going after the same thing. And, and it, it, it's really, uh, uh, quite frankly speaking, overwhelming and discouraging. It is overwhelming, and and it can be discouraging if you continue to dwell on it. You got to put the 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 public has to put some faith in their in their government, in their elected officials, that they have um, um, their best interest at in at heart and are working to solve those problems. As we're having this discussion right now, we I am up in Albany in my office in Albany because we are putting together our budget for this year. Um, just think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to put a budget that will take in about $175 billion dollars and we're doing that in the worst economic crisis that we've seen since the depression so you look at and talk about problems we got them over here too and we're trying to figure out how to do it at a government one of the options that we have at our disposal is to possibly go out there and get some short-term loans the government has to get loans, just like uh, the people have to get loans. And hopefully we'll get them at friendly terms that we'll be able to pay back over the course of uh, several months and years going forward but to deal with the problems we have today. There are many problems out there, but there are also many smart people working to solve them. We will get through this. Well, thank you for leading us in the forefront. Thank you for leading us in the forefront <laughs> of finding resolution because thank that's you, really Rena. what this conversation should be. And um, as our one of our leaders, how do you feel uh, people should um, start? I guess researching and and or where should they go to 
create re resolution and find resolve in whether it be uh, personally and or through business. So where do you, where should people should be where should they be looking? Well, I, I could assist by saying you contact any of your elected officials, be it my office, both in Throgs Neck or Co-op City, um, Senator Bailey's office, um, uh, Assemblyman Speaker Carl Hasty's office, um, Congressman Engel's office, Councilman King's office, and, and Councilman Jonai's. All of those offices will have resources for the per uh, people at their disposal and be able to get back to, uh, uh, and tell them right then and there. And if they don't, they will get back to them. So that's one thing. The other thing to do, I know a lot of parents are out there, the kids are home. Okay, what are we going to do with the kids all day? Kids need structure. And the parents now are becoming instant teachers. And they got, see, it's in, do you see this? Uh, <laughs> you you got it there. And you, I'm sure, Rena, has set up a structured setting for your your daughter. Okay. At such and such an hour, they're going to be doing this. Next hour, you're going to do this. Next hour is a little bit of rest and lunch. And then we go back to academics. And you can go on the Board of Education website. You can go on the United Federation of Teachers website. You can go on the Council of Supervisors and Administrators, uh, administrators website. All of them, as well as the New York State Department of Education. They will all have valuable resources of how to organize time and give you ideas of what to do depending upon age level of your child. That's all valuable information. And I think that is a reality we all have to come to terms with is like, I, I me personally, I've always been a multitasker, but this is new to a lot of people. It is. It is difficult. Listen, um, these are difficult times. At difficult times, though, um, this country has come, come together. During the course of World War II, uh, at the beginning, we were completely ill prepared to meet the needs and what we need for World War II. No army, no military um, um, uh, machines. Uh, all of a sudden, though, the country got focused did their best in a war effort. And by the end of the war, we were a manufacturing giant. We rose to the occasion. We're going to raise to the occasion in this crisis too, in so many different ways, education and teleeducation being one of them. Um, um, everybody should keep the hope. That, that's what I was going to say. That was really, really, really hopeful. That's a wonderful way to close this segment. Are there last any, any last words you want to share with our viewers? Well, again, be smart. Uh, listen, I'm not going to hide anything. I am not the youngest person in the world. I am in a situation where I am among those who are in danger. And I have realized slowly, and I'll admit that, I'll uh, realize the, the seriousness of this pandemic, okay? Do the smart things. Stay away from people. Don't interact closely with anybody. If you got to go to the store, stay away from the other people. Let them clear the aisle, then you go down. Do smart things. Wash your hands a lot. Do all the things that the doctors are recommending to you to do, and you'll make it through. But be smart. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Michael Benedetto, the last thing you forgot to say was stay home. Stay, you stay home. And I wish I could be doing that myself, but I got to be here in Albany. Well, but we're, we're trying service, to stop this thank up here. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. a lot, Linda. Thank you. We appreciate you and your commitment to our community. Thank you. Have a good one now. You bye too. Bye. All right. Goodbye, guys, everybody again, out there. Thank you. Once again, you guys, to make an appointment to be tested for COVID-19 at the Bay Plaza Mall mobile testing site, you can call 1-888-364-3065. The site hours are Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, please note that the site will prioritize according to individuals who are high risk. And for more updates from Assemblyman Michael Benedetto, you can follow him on Twitter at Michael Benedetto.
All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll learn how to find a sense of calmness through this crisis. Most at risk for coronavirus, people over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. Many businesses operating in the Bronx have been dealing with the effects of the government-mandated shutdown, like Lobster Place Wholesale, located at the hub for food, Hunts Point. Overnight, our, our, our customers didn't exist anymore. Um, Lobster Place... Uh, sells fresh live and frozen seafood to about 800 regional restaurants, uh, caterers, bars, you know, all types of food service businesses. So when they were directed to shut down, um, you know, there, there wasn't any fish to sell, unfortunately, um, or, or any places to sell it to. Ian McGregor was forced to give thousands of dollars worth of merchandise away upon closing down his family business after over 50 years of service. But the first thing on this CEO's mind were his team members, who he describes as family. Making the decision to close, the, the hardest thing was, you know, how are, how are my employees going to feed themselves? How are they going to pay their rent? You know, how are they going to take care of their families? Um, and... That was a really gut-wrenching part of, of making the decision for me. I really don't have words to describe how I felt as I brought this news to all these folks, this terrible, terrible news. And, and they just sort of looked at me and said, don't worry, boss, we got this, you know, we'll be back. And, um, you know, it, it, it was one of the, the most inspiring things that, that, I've, that I've seen in my professional life. And those people are my heroes, that they really are. For Ian and many other business owners, the decision to close was no easy task. He's had to balance preserving limited resources in order to ensure that jobs for his 250 team members remain secured after this pandemic. Lobster Place has identified different ways to help their team overcome financial hardships. We're doing a variety of things to try and, and, and look after them. We're starting a, a GoFundMe drive. Uh, we're going to pay for health insurance for the month of April. Um, you know, we're, we're anxiously watching the, the legislative process in the federal government because I think there'll be resources available for us to continue to help depending on how that goes. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm recording videos and sending to them uh, every few days and, and just trying to stay connected because at this point, that's what we can do. Businesses like Lobster Place have posted GoFundMes and other links to help assist and uplift their teams during this tough time. To follow and show support to these businesses, keep up with their websites and social media. Follow at Lobster Place Wholesale on Instagram to stay in touch. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. Praise the Lord, I'm Evangelist Barbara Mayo. I have a program called The Great God. I come on every Saturday at 3.30, channel 70 and 36 on files. You need to catch me because it's a, current, uh, a program to encourage, to lift up, and if you don't know anybody that uh, 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 haven't heard about the program, tell them about it. They'll be encouraged, for God is good. God bless you. Hey everyone, welcome back to our remote version of Open. Many people are stressed over the uncertainty that has become our reality and uh, well, struggling to find peace, being surrounded with everything related to COVID-19. Our next guests are a married couple that specialize in helping people find a sense of calmness within chaos. Uh, please welcome Loving Meditations co-founders Tamara Green and David Dashinger. Hello and welcome. Hi, Hello. Rena. How are you? <laughs> so um, good to be good. back. Uh, as good as can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to have you back. I mean, not under these circumstances, but mm -hmm. it's still, however, nice to see you. Yes. Very nice to see you too. Right? Yes. And so uh, and let's introduce everyone to Loving Meditations uh, and its mission, right? Because it's really primarily geared towards uh, cancer orgs inspired by cancer treatment, cancer caring, uh, caregivers, and everything related to 
that illness, however, is obviously applicable to any illness. So uh, let's just give everybody a little more information regarding the specifics of what inspired you to even create this uh, Loving Meditations website. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, it came from the real life experience as a patient and caregiver going through the cancer journey and facing major illness. And there's a lot of component components to the patient experience that are stressful, to say the least. All of us are bombarded with information that's stressful. We're put in environments like waiting rooms or exam rooms, waiting for tests, waiting for answers, waiting for information. And so as we went through that journey, we saw there were so many points where we could actually make it a little more calm and make it easier to have to be in those environments um, to receive the, the care that we all need. Right. And so there's, uh, we're basically referring to everyone um, in, in this crisis that we're dealing with. Uh, and so um, I know there's a book written. Um, uh, we know that you guys have uh, had quite much success with this program. And so how are you implementing it into our current status? Right. Uh, this is very interesting times, isn't it, Rena? Wow. Um, what we're doing to incorporate it in is uh, this is kind of the worst fear that everyone has is happening now. And so much of what our programs are about on our app or what we talk about in our books is how to reduce, uh, actually get some benefit out of what the fear, the fear that's actually coming up. So let me give you an example of what I mean. We have been pretty much operating from what I call conditional living right? Things have to be just so in order for me to feel calm and good. But if they're not so, my whole world gets rocked, right? And that's really what's happening right now. So the key is to get to unconditional living, which means which you can only get from yourself. So in other words, it doesn't matter what's happening around us, we still remain the center of our own peace. And that's the core of all of our programs in the app or book or whatever the or videos, whatever we have, is for you, whether you're a, a stage four cancer patient or a caregiver that's stressed out or worried, you know, that you're going to get the coronavirus virus, that you stay centered and, and grounded and you may have moments of fear, but you keep coming back to you being the solid foundation of of groundedness and centeredness. David, how has this been for you? On a couple of levels, it's been remarkable. I'm a career firefighter. I was down at ground zero uh, the day after 9-11. So I've witnessed firsthand what that's like. And now it's brought it into everyone's house. So we are seeing fear, anxiety, worry on an unprecedented level. And, um, and it's changing healthcare. Like overnight, healthcare has changed dramatically where, you know, if you do have to go to the hospital, you're on your own. And if you need to see a doctor, you're doing it on your iPad or your computer. So it's been remarkable and also an opportunity for all of us to like start to look at, we're all in this together. Like, what can we do to get through it? And um, and so it's it's bringing up some innovative changes, which could, in the long run, be very beneficial. Right, and and it, it's uh, what we're discussing right now. It's a mindset, and yes. I think this important this conversation is so important right now because while everyone is concerned about you know being infected or or, or what the um, the uncertainty is, because that's really I think what has everybody in, in a panic there's that mental state that is also being uh, tampered with as well. And there hence comes the, okay, well, how do you even balance that? There's, uh, there's not any prescription being offered for that. I mean, yes, you can go and get counsel and so forth, but at this point we're all being asked to self-isolate, which means we have but ourselves to rely on. You got it. And what a beautiful opportunity that is. 
<laughs> you is. can actually see it as a beautiful opportunity to finally go within or finally start to face your demons because um, you know, it all kind of starts from our core wounds. I, you know, I'm a psychotherapist, so I'm speaking from my training, but we have these core wounds usually from childhood, but what orbits around the wound is those little habits that we have, those little addictions, maybe it's food or alcohol or shopping or whatever it may be, or behaviors or habits or, you know, patterns that show up and it orbits around because it's trying to protect us from the deep, deep, deep seated fear of our original like trauma, our original core wound, right? So now you, you kind of take away this, right? We have mm -hmm. people, places, things to do and whatever, bars to go to and all that kind of stuff. And you're kind of left with the core wound. And what do you do with that? And that's what we keep having the conversation with is what do you do with that? And I, I understand we're going to do a meditation at the end and I'm going to be addressing that. Well, as a matter of fact, you, your timing is perfect. Uh, how about we do it now? Let's do it. I want everybody to put their feet on the ground. If you're standing, fine. Okay, but just put your feet flat on the ground so you feel really supported by the earth. You can relax or close your eyes. Allow your body to begin to relax by taking in a nice deep breath all the way in, all the way in. Exhale out of your mouth and just consciously release tension out of your muscles and move that energy down to your feet, 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 feet. Good. Now with this next breath, you're going to allow yourself to face that fear. Like it's okay. Feel the fear. It's okay. Exhale like a smoke ring. Create space around that fear. Good. Breathe in and go ahead and again, face that fear. Feel that fear. Let it all come to the surface. Exhale, create even a bigger space around that fear. Breathing in and face that fear. Let it come up. Whatever shows up, it's fine. Exhale, even more space. That space keeps getting bigger and bigger around that fear and the fear keeps shrinking. Good, good. Two more breaths. So we breathe in again and allow ourselves to face whatever fear is showing up. It may be shrinking in front of your eyes. And more space around that fear. And then last breath, whatever fear you have left. And exhale, even more space. And that space continues to expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger until there is no fear left. You are in this moment, in this present moment. And it feels expansive. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. How's that feel, Rena? Oh, that was so delightful. I mean, your words, your, your voice is very soothing. We'll start there. But um, I love the term um, present because that is all we are promised. Yes, we are. Now. Yeah. And... Um, I understand that you offer these one minute comms uh, through your Instagram account. Correct. We're doing them on multiple platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and they're on our loving meditations app um, as free content along with um, meditations. Um, we have a number of meditations in Spanish also free that are not really specific to cancer, but specific to activating that kind of presence and that kind of calm. So um, it's our gift to anyone who um, who would like that. And that's on your website, correct, as well? That's correct. Yep. Lovingmeditations.com. Lovingmeditations.com. Thank you so much for that, David, Tamara. Many blessings. You yes. know, on a personal note, I, I adore you both. Yes, I Stay love blessed. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Stay yeah. blessed, healthy, and safe, my friends. Thank you, thank you too. Mm. And uh, mwah. 
we'll and see. for you guys. <laughs> I know we're just gonna send love. love I know love, love, <laughs> it's a love fest. It's lovey meditations. <laughs> you will. Namaste. Namaste. You guys, once again, for practical mind body wellness tools, you can make sure to visit and download the Loving Meditations app. And you can visit them on lovingmeditations.com. And they, they can also be found on the Apple Store and Google Play. And you can also check them out on IG and Facebook at Loving Meditations for one minute to calm techniques. You know, it's uh, definitely important at this time to find balance in your life. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to find out how one art organization is helping artists during this lockdown. Don't go anywhere. Uh, as you know, the coronavirus continues affecting all of our lives in ways that seem pretty unreal. And, uh, well, you know, it's forced all of us to practice social distancing and, and most importantly, to self-isolate. And um, that's actually left a lot of people unemployed and affecting people's livelihoods, um, especially freelance artists. So uh, the Bronx Arts Factory has designed projects to motivate everyone to get creative with an online art challenge. And joining us to tell us more, we welcome Bronx Arts Factory co-founder, Laura Alvarez. ¿Cómo está? Hello. Hello, how are you? Okay, how are you? I'm doing well, home. Well, I gotta tell you, you brightened me up. Uh, you brightened up my day with all the beautiful colors behind you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Is that all of your artwork? It is not actually. It <laughs> my partner he did it with a friend of his um, earlier before I moved in the apartment so years ago, and I loved it. So it's right up my alley. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So Laura, you know, I before we really get into the um, the topic of the BX Arts Factory, um, I would like to just ask you how you're doing and. How your family's doing? I mean, your origins are from Spain. Spain is going through their own version of what we're going through. Have you been able to communicate with your family? What's going on in your world? So I'm fine. I've been telecommuting because I work for the city besides being a BXS factory and a freelance artist. So on that side, I'm lucky enough that I still have a job. And it's hard because I'm working every day from home. You work more hours than you're supposed to. You're uh, trying to do so many things at the same time. And then I'm also trying to keep up with my artwork and trying to communicate with my family. I have like a routine in the morning. I talk to a friend of mine that is here in New York and she's by herself. She lost her job even before the lockdown. So I check on her and then I start working. And then in my lunch break, I call my family in Spain. We have like a group chat with all the family members. And then I have my parents that are locked at, at home and my brothers, each one in a different place. And then my aunt is somewhere else. So we all kind of talk together every day and just to check and see familiar faces and, you know, but it's, it's been a challenge. Well would you say that in some way this is uh, bringing us all closer together? I think so. I think so. Because like before I used to take my lunch break, go into the street and call my parents or call my aunt or call somebody like, and like every other day. But now I know every day at yeah, one o'clock I'm going to connect and I'm going to see them and I'm going to talk to them. And 
I don't know. I think it does bring the people together, even if we're more apart. Right. I know. I'm just trying to find the flip side of it, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. as an artist, I know you're also exercising your own self-therapy through the artistry that you're creating. Um, and what I really appreciate about your work is that you're offering it to everyone to be a part of it, whether they're an artist or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I think that's a great segue into the coloring pages that you've designed that I think are very, very inviting and and really a, a therapeutic practice thank you yeah so i had a coloring pages on my website earlier on um i i love coloring pages that was my favorite favorite thing to do when i was little i will color color all my coloring books and then i will go to my brother i'm like can i color this one and so <laughs> all his coloring books <laughs> and everything else so i always thought that that was very like common for me coloring something and just like that, that thing of being doing something without thinking and kind of like leaves your brain in blank and you can just go and just think of the colors and be at the, that same moment. So I started it years ago. I kind of paused it for a while. And then when the lockdown started in Spain, it started um, over a week earlier than we started here. I, had, I have so many friends with kids and they were stuck home because here you're allowed to go into the parks and you can walk by yourself or you can bike by yourself. In Spain, you can't. Nobody is allowed on the street unless you go into the store, pharmacy or job because you're essential personnel. So it's been very, very hard for people in Spain to keep the family inside the four walls of your house, of your home. And, and I thought, you know, giving them one different coloring sheet every day, it was it was something that you can look forward to. Like, oh, what is it gonna be today? And I don't know, I'm just trying to be helpful. <laughs> I know we're looking at some of them, but how many have you created all, all so far from the time of Spain's lockdown? It's been uh, like almost three weeks. So make the count, like 20 plus. <laughs> wow, every day. So yeah, every, every day, every day. Every single day. Mm -hmm. And so these images are available for people to download on your website. Yes, they can go to my website, to the download section. And you can, um, in the most recent ones, you can download PDF or a JPEG. That's the image or, you know, the ones that you can print out. Uh, and the ones earlier on, they're basically PDFs. It's the same thing. You can print them out. But I started uploading JPEGs because a lot of people is also stuck at home with no access to a printer. But you might have a tablet or you might have something that you can download the Im image and just like, you know, with a paint or something, just go with it. And I have friends that they've done it on their phones, <laughs> just with the, the software that you can download for free. They can you can color it on the phone. Beautiful. And so um, that's one thing that uh, you're contributing to the artist mm -hmm. community. But as a co-founder, of BX Arts Factory, I understand that there's a challenge that the uh, community has also implemented. However, I want to know how the organization is doing without even the art challenge being put into play. So we've been working in different projects now because a lot of our artists have lost their jobs. There a lot of them work in museums, in nonprofits. They do after-school programs. They do art programs, and that's been tough on a lot of them. So we started talking to different organizations. BronxNet is one of them to try to find ways of give, giving them some income, doing some uh, content for families or content for artists. And we also think that as an artist, it's very easy to ruin up block mode and and not being able to create anything and when you're so under so much pressure it's very easy to fall into i'm just going to go to the sofa from the sofa to the bed and from the bed to the sofa and i'm not going to do anything so my i myself i'm just doing every day a portrait that is under five minutes and it's basically like a very quick thing a self-portrait because i'm always here with myself and um so that's something that I look forward every morning when I get up. It's like my meditation moment. So we thought about giving everybody something to create. And and it's when you're in that blocked mo mode, right. you can't see how you're going to create. So a lot of times giving a prompt 
that's the, the list of words that we've done for 14 days. Right. It's just a way of you being able to just think of that word and create something right away. So how, how does one uh, join this challenge? Like, is it something that they're, they're informed by the website through the Instagram account? Like, how do you decide on the theme? So they can go to the, our Instagram account, BXR's Factory, and we have the list of prompts. And they are in Spanish and they're in English and every day. And you can start whatever you want. You can start now. I think all of us that we started at the same time, we're in day seven. Or no, day eight, sorry. But you can start now with the first prompt if you want and just start creating. And basically, it's, a, it's a, just an excuse to create. You don't have to draw it. You don't have to paint it. You don't have to be a skilled artist to do anything. You can dance it. You can make a poem. You can, whatever you feel you want to do, just go ahead and do it. Post it. You can tag us and hashtag BXH Factory, ABXAF. And, um, and just go with the flow. We're unlocking the artist while the lockdown is in. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for inspiring us to unlock the artists while we are locked in. And most importantly, thank you for coloring our day, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> you guys, once again, to participate in Bronx Arts Factory Art Challenge, uh, all you gotta do is you can post your photo, an art uh, piece, you can do uh, poetry, uh, but you gotta follow Bronx Arts Factory on Instagram and hashtag whatever it is that you do create, hashtag BX Arts Factory. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to take a quick break, but uh, when we return, we're gonna hear all about a virtual series involving books. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Open Remote. Bronx Bound Books is a mobile bookstore dedicated to providing the Bronx community with reading and educational resources. And so now that uh, everyone is home due to the outbreak, they decided to host regular virtual read alouds uh, events to engage the community through reading. And joining us to share more about their social distancing series, please welcome Bronx Bound Book founder Latanya. Devon and author of Martina Finds a Shiny Coin and Virtual Read Aloud volunteer Yadira Gonzalez Taylor. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hi, Hi Rina. Hi. How's everybody holding up? We're pretty good. Staying motivated. Yeah. I'm and doing okay. Trying yeah. to stay um, productive and at the same time sit still. Right. Pretty much that, that that's all of our positions, right? So, um, Latanya, I, I'd like to introduce the Bronx uh, Bound Books uh, mobile idea first uh, so that people understand what uh, Bronx Bound Books is destined to be. Bronx Bound Books is destined to be a mobile bookstore. We're working to convert a school bus into a bookstore that will travel to any area of the Bronx, selling books, hosting events, bringing authors, and anything that would happen at a regular bookstore on and outside the bus. That's beautiful. The, the visuals of it is so beautiful. So a school bus that's traveling throughout different communities that is almost like a floating library. Yes. 
Yeah, but we'll be selling books and also giving books away for free. And our books will be mostly reduced price. We want to target those areas, especially that have like a two fair zone or, you know, with the MTA being slow, it shouldn't take a person a very long time to get to their nearest bookstore. So if your bookstore is 30 minutes away, the closest one to you, we want to meet you halfway and be at that halfway point. So you can just buy a book and, you know, enjoy it at home or enjoy any event that, that we have to offer that day. I love the whole concept. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, we uh, I'm, are gonna assume that all your vision got put on pause momentarily. Uh, however, uh, like everyone else, we're all adapting and adjusting to our per present circumstances. And uh, let's talk a little bit about this virtual series that I believe, Jadira, you're uh, leading on it, correct? Yes, I am. Uh, it started sort of as a coincidence. I was talking to Latanya and I said, well, I think it, maybe it would be nice if I read my books on live or at least read my one book, uh, Martina Finds a Shiny Coin. And we got on and people liked it. And then we spoke that night and I said, why don't we start inviting other authors and volunteers and people from the community to read out loud? And it's become it, it became a very organic mission or a very organic um, event where every day or every other day we invite someone. People have signed up. We have over 60 volunteers signed up. And we're now moved on to Zoom with them where we interview a little bit. Uh, we interview them a little bit and then they read their book. It's, been, it's become a very interesting thing that just kind of morphed into something to do where parents can use it as an educational tool. That's lovely. And so how often are they occurring? Is, it, is there a set schedule? I know you said it's organically morphed itself. However, as it's morphing itself, um, is there a scheduled time where people can anticipate these read alouds? So I am working for, from home uh, for the organization that I work for. So it's becoming a four o'clock to five o'clock, between four and five o'clock tentatively. But we do announce it on Facebook at least two days in advance. So people can actually RSVP to attend. And then we try to do watch parties through our own pages. All right, we're going to come back to you. Latanya, uh, this floating bookstore, is it geared primarily towards children? No, um, it's geared to anyone that wants to read. Over the summer, I was out in the community just getting information, finding out what they need in a bookstore. I was out at the farmer's markets, uh, at uh, um, Belvis Hospital out in the Bronx, uh, St. Mary's Parks. I've made great contact with all the parks, group, well, a lot of parks groups, and just getting information. And a lot of people were, were adults. There were people that were struggling to learn how to read as well. So... Um, I met a, a few adults that were learning English and Spanish, and I reached out to Scholastics for some bilingual books, and they were able to, you know, donate. So it's anyone that's interested in reading, and if you're not, just finding out what we, what we have to offer. Sometimes we'll have um, a poetry reading or a book signing or some arts and crafts as well, but they're all book-related. Right, and so... I know you come from a, a coordinating background as well. And yeah. so how is this virtual lifestyle now going to contribute to the vision that you've already embarked? I mean, you're already on that, on that wagon. Uh, it's just, you've been delayed right now. Yeah. Well, actually over the summer, we wanted to do a virtual read aloud and I kept pushing it back and I'm like, you know what, not, I don't think it's the right time. I don't think it's the right time. So the virtual read aloud isn't far off our mission. It's right on our mission. We want to make, you know, books and literacy accessible. So what better way to get, you know, people connected through liter literacy, you know, by using social media. No, it's great. And Jadira. Um, I know that you tend to uh, in, involve yourself and, and really you almost take uh, leadership in, in everything related to books. I mean, aside from being an author, I know you're part of the um, the uh, Comité Noviembre um, as far as the book component, uh, as well as the uh, Comadres in the Bronx. Uh, how did this come about for you? I mean, you've just you keep taking on these responsibilities related to books and, and obviously it's something that means a lot to you. So um, just share a little bit uh, why uh, you feel compelled to take on these responsibilities as a volunteer. 
I think it's a natural thing for me as an attorney. We have to be good readers and writers. So I feel like I, I it's, it's not necessarily a calling, but an obligation to bring literacy to people in the Bronx, specifically children. We lack bookstores. We lack access to knowledge and information. And it's not by our own fault. It's just by virtue of the place of where we live. So I, I'm involved in the community. I bring books, I bring literacy, because I think it's a, it's a highway to social stratification, economic stratification, and education. Is, it's, the, it's a way to be. And we want our kids to grow up, be educated, become lawyers, doctors, judges, teachers, firemen, all of that good stuff, and for them to stay in the Bronx, because that's how we move forward. Right. Latanya? You have I any agree. words to piggyback off of? <laughs> I agree. I met Yadira at a, a writing workshop that I hosted, and we've stayed connected ever since. And watching her just, uh, she's phenomenal. And she takes on, she took on the project, and she's like, she is the leader. You know, I'm hands on, but she's like ev everything on. And I, I really appreciate her efforts, you know. And I, I stay connected with a lot of the writers that I've met for the last 10 years. I've done so much work. And this is just the next phase, you know, I've helped a lot of writers get to the page to even publish books. And hopefully, you know, those books will find a place, you know, in Bronx Bound Books on the shelf and I'll be able to help them sell it as well. Well, so I applaud, oh my gosh, I, yes, girl. I applaud your commitment to your immediate community. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. And I always look back to see who I could work with. If you met me once, more than likely we'll continue to work together. That's what's it's up. Anyway, mm -hmm. that, that as it should be. Um, Yadira, before we go, I just want you to see that. Look, I have my copy of my Pina has a shiny <laughs> coin. Nice. I don't know how many years ago. But uh, it was about seven years ago when I published, I went on your show. It was one of the first things I did in the literary community. And then, like Latanya said, I met her. She won't tell you she's phenomenal, but she's very, very <laughs> phenomenal. She's, she brings together this literary community that exists in the Bronx. So you opened up reading this, right? So we missed the reading of Martina? Yes, but it's still on there. So you guys can go on and watch it again. And that's on Facebook, right? Yes, on the, on the page for Bronx Bound Books. Awesome. All right. So before we go, when, when's the next uh, virtual read aloud? So the next one we're having is a, um, um, Latanya, can you help me? Because she has a very beautiful name, but I'm having a hard time pronouncing Mary Helena, it. Well, Mary Helena? Yes. She's going to be on Friday at four o'clock. Who's going to be on at Friday at four o'clock? Hmm? Mary Helena Wells. She's a track she's a star from track the Bronx. Star from the Bronx. Beautiful. And that's going to be on your Facebook page and your Instagram as well. Yes. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us, ladies. Latanya, Yadira. Thank, thank you. you. I say stay to everybody, safe. stay blessed, healthy, and safe. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Latanya. Latanya. All right. You guys, once again, for the next Social Distancing Virtual Read Aloud series, follow Bronx Bound Books on Facebook. And you can also find them on Instagram at Bronx Bound Books. Don't go anywhere. Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. Hey there, sports fans. Good morning here on BronxNet. Bobby C. again from the world's most famous arena. We'll continue our series here, the top 10 Broadway blue shirts of all time. At number 
10, winger Adam Graves. Graves was the heart and soul of the 1994 Stanley Cup champions. He's also a fan favorite because of his community work with children off the ice. He scored a then franchise record 52 goals in 1993-94 and his 280 career goals ranked third all time in Rangers history. Two-time MVP, four-time winner of the Players' Player Award as voted by his teammates. Five-time winner of the Stephen McDonald Extra Effort Award. Graves cracks a pretty tough list. And at number nine, a current Ranger but still a living legend, Henrik Lundqvist. He's been the name above the title on the marquee for over a decade on Broadway. Henrik holds every franchise goaltending statistical record. The Kings' 459 career wins and counting atop that list. The netminder won the 2011-12 Vesna. Before winning the trophy, he was nominated in each of his first three seasons and is the only goaltender in NHL history to record 30 win seasons in his first 12 campaigns. When it's all said and done, expect King Henrik to rise on this list. From one great netminder to another, at number eight, Eddie Eddie, Eddie, Ed Jockaman. November 2nd, 1975, the Garden fans rooted for the Red Wings, filling MSG with those chants against the Rangers two days after number one had been shockingly waved to Detroit. That deal almost overshadowed the goaltender's brilliance when he suited up for those elite Ranger teams in the late 60s and early 70s. He is third in club history with 266 wins and second with 49 shutouts. Keeping with the goalie trend, King Henrik, Eddie, and the great Mike Richter, who is arguably the best in franchise history. He takes the seventh spot on my list. 1994, as we know, would not exist without the goaltender's unworldly performance in Game 6 of the Eastern Conference Finals at the Meadowlands and what became his defining moment. His career was later sabotaged by a series of injuries, but I choose to remember him at his best. He had a spectacular 1995-96 and a brilliant 1997 playoffs in leading the Blue Shirts to the conference finals. He is second in franchise history with 301 wins. We move from the net to the defense where this Rangers star from 1968 to 1975 was the best defenseman in the NHL not named Bobby Orr. For eight seasons on Broadway, Brad Park was a swashbuckling, offensive-minded weapon who never minded dropping his gloves. Park scored 25 goals and recorded 82 points at 73-74, both at the time club records for a defenseman. He was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1988 and in 2017 was named one of the 100 greatest NHL players in history. Park earns the sixth spot. Coming in at number five, Jean Rattel. He finished his career sixth all-time in points. It's no surprise his number 19 hangs in the rafters at the Garden. As elegant and classy an athlete to ever wear the sweater, he made his Rangers debut in 1960-61 and became the linchpin of the attack through the glory days of the franchise. Jean scored 46 goals and recorded 109 points in 71-72, despite missing the final 15 games of the year with a broken ankle. He was voted player's player four straight seasons, beginning with 67-68, two-time club MVP, third on the all-time list with 817 points, and second with 336 goals, the epitome of a New York Ranger. Eddie Bathgate is one of the most feared sharpshooters in NHL history. He takes the fourth spot on my top 10 New York Rangers of all time. One of the best fighters of his time in an era when a team's best players were also often their toughest. And he had a lethal wrist shot and backhand and was an even more accomplished playmaker than scorer. He won the 1958-59 Hart Trophy after an 88-point season in which he scored a career-high 40 goals. He tied for the NHL lead in points with 84 in 1961-62, but the Art Ross went to Bobby Hull, who had 50 goals to Bathgate's 28. Nonetheless, he is fourth in all-time franchise goals, assists, and points. That leaves us with three. Let's start with the most charismatic and well-known Ranger of his time, Rod Gilbert. He comes in at number three. Rod scored a career-high 43 goals in 1971-72 when he recorded 97 points. 
He is the all-time franchise leader in goals, racking up 406, and in points with 1,021. Gilbert played his entire career with the Rangers, choosing to retire early in 1977-78, rather than perhaps join pals Rotel and Park in Boston. At number two, the captain. Marc Messier is arguably the most significant player in modern franchise history. The captain promised to slay the dragon upon his arrival from Edmonton, and he did. Number 11 made the guarantee heard round the world, which he miraculously backed up with that third period hat trick in game six of the Stanley Cup Finals. He is second on the all-time career list for playoff points and regular season games played, and third for regular season points. More importantly, he's a six-time Stanley Cup champion and the only player to captain two professional NHL teams to championships. His playoff leadership ended a 54-year Stanley Cup drought for the Rangers. Messier was great, but some of his finest seasons were away from New York. Our top spot on this list goes to a player who is not only the best defenseman in franchise history, but who had the greatest career as a Ranger in franchise history. Brian Leach starred on Broadway from 1988 to 2004. He won the Conn Smythe in 1994 with a playoff leading 34 points. The consummate puck mover and two-way weapon won the Norris Trophy in 1992 and in 1997. Leach is a two-time first-team All-Star and three-time second-teamer. He holds franchise records for goals, assists, and points by a defenseman and is second all-time in overall points. His 1,129 games in a Rangers sweater is second all-time. Man, oh man, do we miss hockey. We're looking forward to the return of the Rangers and the NHL. In the meantime, here's a check-in on sports that are still in action. Well, it seems there is one sport still in business, kind of. Motorsport has found an alternative during the COVID-19 pandemic. Virtual racing is keeping sports fans occupied, from NASCAR to F1 to MotoGP and IndyCar. On Saturday, Sage Karam got the virtual IndyCar iRacing Challenge rolling. He won from pole in the American Red Cross Grand Prix at Watkins Glen International in upstate New York. Sage, who turned 25 in March, won a race with no prior experience at the Glen, but he's got plenty of virtual racing experience. We're all competitors. We all want to do our best. We all want to win. And um, it was really impressive to see everybody, um, you know, you know, grab it by the horns and, and and get after it. So, um, you know, big hats off to IndyCar, big hats off to the drivers, um, you know, all the teams, everybody who made it happen. It was a really cool event, and I really hope the fans enjoyed it. Karam led 43 of the 45 laps. While this may have been his first virtual win against a full field of IndyCar drivers, he is no stranger to victory lane in iRacing. It was his 144th iRacing road course win in 533 starts and his 165th iRacing victory overall. For the win, he will have a donation to American Red Cross made in his name by IndyCar, and he earns a virtual winner's trophy and a ring from Jostens. Yeah, in, in these times, it, it was nice to do something, you know, for the fans and for ourselves. You know, we're competitors and we, we don't want to sit around all the time just waiting. So, uh, yeah, good fun. I think it's good. Obviously, we all want to get back in the real car, get back testing and all that. Um, but in the meantime, um, this, is, this is what we got. And um, it's kind of amazing that you can get a bunch of drivers all in different places racing a race in cars that look exactly the same and doing about the same lap times uh, just shows you what technology how far technology's come in the last 20 years
welcome back to Open Remote. Our last guest is a saxophonist, composer, and educator who is also a Grammy Award and Downbeat Critics Poll winner. He's a lecturer of jazz improvisation at the Yale School of Music. And today he's here to tell us more about his musical self, the virtual classes he's offering, and his upcoming album, The Humble Warrior. Please welcome Wayne Escoffrey. Hi, Wayne. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm hanging in there, you know, hunkering down here in the Bronx doing my thing. Yeah, I feel you. Huh? But at least you're, you're doing virtual classes though, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, like I've been telling my, 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 my close friends and loved ones, you know, at least we have music in our lives to keep us engaged and active. So. So talk, talk to me and share a little bit about, uh, share a little bit uh, uh, what your schedule looks like, right? Because you teach uh, at different universities, correct? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, for the fall semester before all of this, I was teaching at the Yale School of Music, and I still am a professor of jazz improvisation and also a combo instructor at the Yale School of Music in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and um, for the spring semester, uh, I was asked to be visiting uh, artists in, um, in jazz studies at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Uh, in addition to that, I teach a program called Jazz for Teens, uh, which is a part of NJPAC in, in Newark, New Jersey. So before all of this, I was doing all of those things and traveling all, you know, between uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Williamstown, Massachusetts, and Newark, teaching all these programs, but now it's all virtual. So um, uh, basically, uh, probably about three days a week, I'm online uh, teaching students and giving them assignments and doing lectures the same way we're speaking right now. So, and they don't overlap, obviously, right? No, well, I guess the good thing is that we're a little bit more free with the scheduling, so we make sure that uh, that it all works out. And then, of course, in addition to my private instruction, I, you know, I do some Skype lessons, some one-on-one -on -one saxophone lessons and improvisation instruction. So, uh, as it turns out, I'm actually pretty busy here at home, so. Do you find that you're busier being at home? Well, it's a combination of not being busy at all and being and, and then being too busy, you know, because uh, because of the way social media is and we're all connected in a certain way. You know, you see so many people doing so many things. and You're like, man, I'm lazy. I got I to do this. I got to do that. And then the next thing you know, you're packed with all these things that you're trying to do. So it's it's finding that balance. I mean, it's in a, in a way it's a, it's a good good lesson for all of us to try to figure out um, exactly how much we need to do and how much we want to do and, and all that. You know, that's a really good point. Do you find that your pace has shifted? Yeah, it is. You know, the one thing, the one advantage about being a jazz musician is we're, we're really, we're really uh, always self-motivated -motiv and we kind of always work from home anyway. I mean, you know, a regular jazz musician's schedule is really, he's, he or she is home practicing for most of the day, learning music, um, you know, doing some business online, and then in, in the evening you're playing. So you end up self-regulating your, your schedule as it is. But um, so it's kind of a lot more of the same. The difference is now we don't get that outlet to actually leave the house and, and, and you know, release the music. Right. I, I feel you. But uh, as an artist, I'm saying um, when you're already used to kind of getting to this place by this time and, and trying to get to this other place and trying to meet these deadlines. And now you're while you do have a certain set schedule, the, the pace in which things are operating, because I, I, I almost feel like our priorities have shifted. Sure, sure. And you know, what's well, for me, for, for me, I, I don't know that my priorities are shifted so much, just that now I have less excuses. You know, before, in a way, I'd be like, man, I really want to get my online thing happening. I want to do this. I got to do this, but I'm so busy. Now I'm kind of like, well, uh, now's the time to do it. So now I have to fit in all of the things that I always wanted to do, like reorganize my office space, you know, do things like that with still teaching and, and, and making lesson plans and doing all of that. So yeah, it's a lot of stuff going on all at once. We're, you know, it's it's funny because we're all in our own heads, and we all we're all our own own. Deep, we all have a, our own worst enemy uh, as well, too. You know, so. Yeah. Well. Um, so how's that coming along? <laughs> <laughs> well, some days there are good days, and some days there are bad days. That's why I'm glad. Like I said, that's why I'm glad I have music. Um, I have a few close friends and loved ones to help me out here and there. So, uh, you know, lucky we have that. Yeah, and also you have a, an album coming out, right? You have a, a debut uh, release. I do, and that's a, that's a that's a nice thing that's happening. Even though I'm not, you know, getting out, um, I have a new album on the Smoke Sessions label. And Smoke is a jazz club where I, I really uh, kind of uh, 
grew up in in many in many respects playing in a new york city it's on the upper west side on 106 and broadway and they have a record label smoke session so they're putting out my um i've signed to that label and they're putting out my next record it's coming out april 10th and actually the cd release performance was going to be that week starting april 9th i was going to perform for a week at smoke now that's not happening but the cd's still coming out there's still going to be a lot of things i'm going to be posting and different different clips and stuff so it's it's an exciting time man. well would you be doing a virtual a concert or some sort? I might be organizing something small. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't mean to pressure you. But I, don't like give, to be the new I, don't, I don't like giving my stuff away though, so I might just wait until after this is over and then <laughs> no, nah, I'm kidding. I'll do I'm gonna diff, definitely give a little taste of what's 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 to come. So we're, we're I'm trying to figure out the the, the uh, technical aspects of all that, but we'll try to do something, sure. Well you're gonna give us a taste of something today, right? What are you gonna be giving us a taste of? Uh, I'm probably just going to improvise. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a saying in the jazz community that uh, you can't lose with the blues. And we all have a bit of the blues now. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, the blues has always uh, given us a, a format for expressing what's happening. So that's what I'll do. I'll give you some blues. All right. So you ready to give us some blues now? Sure. Oh, boy. Here we go. Everybody, please welcome Ways. Wayne Escoffrey. <laughs> you everyone that was Wayne and Scott Ray just improvising some blues on his sax you see you changed the tone of my voice and everything <laughs> good 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 yeah it's important it's important to just be in touch it is it is it makes us uh it just brings us back to the basics basics the basics of basics of life the basics of uh, soul <laughs> Yeah, and thank you for touching mine. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And you guys, once again, The Humble Warrior is going to debut April 10th. And uh, for private lessons with Wayne, you can visit wayneescoffrey.com. And for more on his music, check out his Instagram at Wayne underscore Escoffrey. That is our show today, mi gente. 
thanks to all our guests for coming through and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recablecast tonight and 24 hours a day at BronxNet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor, digitally linked, in solidarity, reminding you we are all in this together. And uh, stay blessed, healthy, and safe. And remember, stay home. Prayers up. Stay home.